Okay. So today is the 24th of January 2018. I'm interviewing Dr. Robert Weinberg and um, we're gonna just sort of start at the beginning and just work our way through. Um, so where were you born? I was born in Utica, New York, January 23rd, 1950. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it was because it's still your birthday. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, what'd your parents do? My parents when I first was born, ran uh, Weinberg's Creamery. They were dairy people. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a milkman. And they had the d dairy store in the Jewish-Polish ghetto. By 1955, the Jews had moved out, the Poles had moved out, and the, I think it was the 1947 Housing Act created the projects. And they built the projects down in the Jewish-Polish neighborhood. And so my folks, being survivors, cut the store in half. Half dairy serving ice cream and then half variety goods. And by the 56, something like that, the whole store was a variety store catering to the black community. Okay. Uh, do you have any brothers or sisters? I still have one brother. I had an older brother who died when he was 42 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm the middle child. Okay. As you probably will find out going through this interview. <laughs> well, I'm glad you pre um, pre-serviced that then. <laughs> um, so when you were thinking of, when you were in high school, did you think you would be going into social work? Did you have any idea what you'd be leaning toward at that point? I didn't even want to go to college. Mm -hmm. I hated school. I was the intellectual runt of my mother's litter. <laughs> and I wasn't going to go to college. I was going to stay another year in high school and play around and have fun. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, yeah, that's fine, but you're not living here. Oh. <laughs> so I sent $10 to a college service in those days. It was $10, and I got about 100 responses and I ended up going to Long Island University in Brooklyn mm -hmm. for my first year. Okay. My father died on the second day of my sophomore year and I had a 10 year old brother at home and I kind of felt relieved that I, I dropped out of school to be with him and be back home and I didn't quite understand that my mother was a widow and she'd have to run the store and I didn't quite get any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I came back and helped run the store, help hang out with my younger brother, and mm -hmm. uh, my older brother was in law school. Mm -hmm. And I think you're leading to social work. Yeah. And during that time, I picked up coaching baseball with mm -hmm. my brother, who was eight years younger than I was. So I took his little league team, it was a brand new team that mm -hmm. expanded, and I did that for the next eight years and really loved being involved in that kind of youth work. And I went to Utica College one time and I failed out, but I got a medical withdrawal because I was kind of nuts. My father died, it was the 60s, it was crazy time. Sure. And uh, then I went to a community college for a little while, didn't flunk out of there, but I quit and then I was the cook at Utica College, where I ended up graduating, was one of my baseball mentors for years. And he called up my mother and said, does Bobby want to play baseball for Utica College? And my mother, without asking me, said, yes, he does. <laughs> and I had an interview with the coach and the director of admissions. And to this day, you won't find an application for me in that school. And I made a promise to myself that I would study as hard as I put in the work for baseball. And mm -hmm. that's when I became pretty good. And somebody said to me, why don't you major in social work? I, I said, social work, what's that? And they said, well, it's, you know, it's helping people and working with kids. And I said, well, how are you doing that? And I said, I'll major in English. And I wasn't terribly worldly or ter terribly bright. And perhaps some would say I'm not now. Uh, but I couldn't imagine getting a college degree for doing something that I love, and that was reading. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna give me a degree for reading? <laughs> well, 
well, the short of it is I never, I didn't read a novel for 15 years after I was an English major because <laughs> that wasn't reading. <laughs> that, that, that was, that was just boom, 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 test, test, paper, paper. So, uh, I had a young woman that was a friend of mine, very close for five years during that period of time, and uh, we got married in 1973. And we became VISTA volunteers on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. Okay. Where For, was that? In Black and, well, it, you wouldn't find it on the map, but mm -hmm. Browning, Montana. Okay. Around Cutbank, Montana, in between Browning and Cutbank, okay. we lived in a little enclave of 128 people. And that's where my soul got burned. Mm. And I said, Oh, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to help people. I want to solve this poverty stuff. I want. To, I really want to do it. And that was the beginning. I applied mm -hmm. to graduate school. Went to Syracuse. Went to Pittsburgh. After you got you got to work for two years. So I worked at the I worked at the Central Association for the Blind after my master's degree, mm -hmm. and was an advocate for blind people. Mm -hmm. And college students at the time there was no ADA. Mm -hmm. So it was really tough because yeah. the teachers would talk like this to blind students. <laughs> just increase the volume. Uh, because they didn't think the they could hear, you know. <laughs> yeah, just increase volume. That'll make them understand. Yeah, right, exactly. Or see. Yeah. And uh, I got to Pittsburgh. And my second week there, there was a notice on the bulletin board, researcher needed at Pittsburgh Blind Association. Mm -hmm. And Pittsburgh Blind Association was from here to perhaps the library okay. from where my office was at, at the University of Pittsburgh. Gotcha. So I went to my chair and I said to him, he wasn't my chair at the time, he was my research teacher, I said, there's a job at Pittsburgh Blind Association for a researcher, but I don't really know how to do research. He says, by the time they start the project, you will. <laughs> and it was true. Yeah. I did. <laughs> and, and so I worked the rest of my doctoral program at Pittsburgh Blind Association and wrote my dissertation on services to the blind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I had one job offer, one, mm -hmm. and we had a baby. My dissertation was defended on June the 28th because that's what we thought his due date was going to be the 29th or 30th. It wasn't until the 7th of, uh, 8th of July. Mm -hmm. So we came down here with a three week old. Wow. And that was, he'll be 38 in July. Yeah. And it was my only job. <laughs> so you took it. Yeah, <laughs> I got offered another job later. And then during the course of my career, I've been solicited for work elsewhere. But we built a nice family here and set of friends here. And, and to me, teaching, I couldn't care less whether I taught the kids at Harvard or the kids here at UNCG, the, to me, teaching is a calling. And mm -hmm. what difference does it make who you got? The, the diamonds are the diamonds in the rough. Right. And it's actually better dealing with the diamonds in the rough because you can act. Most of the kids that go to these Harvards and Stanfords, they come in as diamonds. Mm -hmm. There's no work to be done with them. There's no challenge. No challenge. So that's, that's it in a nutshell okay. why I'm here. Okay. Uh, first impressions of UNCG? Man, it, I was awed by the smart people because there were the remnants of women's college were still left over. It mm -hmm. was not a machine like it is now. Gotcha. What year did you arrive? 1980. 1980. Okay. So that's long after they had already um, uh, allowed men to join. 63. But it took a while for uh, the board and the people to try to turn this into a university. Mm -hmm. It was still a small college atmosphere. Okay. Ideas counted. Teaching was important. Uh, you didn't have to have a list of publications a mile long. You didn't have to chase money mm -hmm. to keep this big greasy machine going. Mm -hmm. It was It was in the air. I, you could tell when they hired Moran that that was the change that we were going to become a corporate university. Mm -hmm. And so then there was the talk of money, but there was no grants office when I got here. Mm -hmm. there, people Didn't. were happy to get a publication, <laughs> not forced. <laughs> By the atmosphere, they were just... Right, and, and we had some great scholars here, mm -hmm. Dick Bardoff, Warren Ashby, Alan Trelease, uh, 
and a long history of tremendous women. Mm -hmm. Harriet Elliott, Mary Mossman, mm -hmm. and my mentor and the person instrumental in hiring me, Virginia Stevens, mm -hmm. was hired uh, by Mary Mossman to start social work. And it was the first year that I came that it was a department. Mm -hmm. It was out of anthropology and sociology. That, that was how Mossman put it. Mm -hmm. And Virginia just did a little section of a social work kind of minor. Mm -hmm. and then in 80, we became a, a department. Mm -hmm. In anthropology and sociology were our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think we were, they just thought we were teaching people how to serve soup at the soup kitchen. And that, that spirit has remained at the underpinnings of many of our documents around promotion and tenure and things like that. Mm -hmm. That social work was just, didn't have a knowledge base, it was service oriented. And what the hell do you need a doctorate or a bachelor's degree for serving a Greensboro Urban Ministry? Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. No, uh, and to give you a snapshot, one of my favorite people of all times here at the university is a guy named Bill Knox. He was a sociologist, but always jabbing at social work that mm -hmm. we weren't smart. But he, he sort of thought maybe I had a little bit of a brain because we would joust <laughs> now and then. And there was intellectual elitism that yeah. takes place in the university. It still takes place. The college people think that they're the owners of the knowledge and that they ought to be the head of designing what a liberal education is all about, which maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, but Knox was the chair of social sociology and I was the chair of social work at the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get it because I rose through the ranks as the smartest guy on the block. I, I got it because the two next people in line took jobs elsewhere. Oh. <laughs> and yeah. no, nobody was going to give us new positions. Mm -hmm. So they just jacked me up you to the chair. You just happened to be in the room at the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, Knox had uh, a picture of Rodan thinker sitting on the bulletin board where they did all the advertising and it said get civilized without ever leaving your chair because at that time sociology was big in data sets and demography and doing analysis and you could crank out publications mm -hmm. so I walked into Knox's office I said hey Knox and I, and I called him Knox mm -hmm. I said you know you know the difference between sociology and social work and Knox was sitting there with his glasses and his gray hair and he was he would be your, oh God, your kind of intellectual, liberal, white, waspy guy. Mm -hmm. Wonderful man. Mm -hmm. And he said, no. I said, well, you guys think you can get civilized without leaving your chair, and we don't believe you can be civilized until you leave your chair. <laughs> and that, that, uh, it ruffled them a little bit. Then they started to do a couple courses in groups <laughs> and things like that. I said, hey, hey, Bill, you know, sociology of groups, you know what that is? He go, what? I said, social work. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was kind of mouthy from when I got here. Sounds that way. But I was a trained community organizer. Okay. And so I came from a part of social work that wasn't touchy-feely in therapy. Mm -hmm. Now my wife's a therapist, and if I said touchy-feely in front of her, and my daughter's a therapist, but they, they're committed to the kinds of things that when you go in social work and do the macro piece or the communities and organizations. Uh, my wife was precinct chair for 11 years in our precinct and always involved in elections and, and very much involved in community affairs. Mm -hmm. We're taught in social work that that's your responsibility even if you go down the therapeutic pipeline. Mm -hmm. Not any longer. People who want to become in social work now just want to be therapists. They couldn't give a hoot about, they give lip service to justice, but they don't get off their chair. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's what I look like as a community <laughs> organizer. <laughs> Like like a man in a in a in a mane, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how far down did I get on these questions? Um, well, we had uh, we had stopped when you were just you were just arrived because it had just become a department of social work. Right. Um, so tell me about Virginia Stevens hiring you. 
Did you find you at a conference or something? Or No, they, they hired somebody else who turned him down, a guy oh. named Gary Bowen. Now he's a dean at Chapel Hill. Okay. <laughs> and so they were desperate. Right, so they, they find you and, and they bring you down. Virginia south. wasn't, Tom Scullion was the chair, but Virginia okay. uh, was the the southern impetus behind social work. She gotcha. Would, the she was feisty. She's still alive. She's in a home in uh, Raleigh. She's about 86, 87, yeah. and I'm 68. Mm -hmm. But she taught me how to be southern. Mm -hmm. So what, what does that entail? That if you're going to write a letter to the editor, you're going to get a haircut before you go down there and they take your picture. <laughs> Uh, nobody ever talked to me like that, but Virginia, <laughs> I got it. Yeah. I, I understood it. She was one of the most committed people that I'd met. She she was her own kind of community organizer. Mm -hmm. She would help start Greensboro Urban Ministry. She started the Alzheimer's Support Group. She, which is now on uh, its own office and. Uh, very much involved in the community. Mm -hmm. So I took my cues that it was okay to be out in the community from her, mm -hmm. not from my boss, Tom. Right. Uh, and they didn't kind of like it. They brought us, the three of us in at the same time, Patty Spakes, Jerry Finn, and me, to be able to compete in this cranking of papers out mm -hmm. and, and uh, with the rest of the social scientists in the College of Arts and Sciences. Mm -hmm. So for me to be constantly running out in the community, being involved in this event or that event, really didn't sit well with Tom Scullion. Mm -hmm. We used to have a little thing, you know, like in an office where you check in and you uh, check out. Sure. But it served as a behavior modification thing when you saw everybody in their offices. Mm -hmm. But I never missed a meeting with a student. I never mm -hmm. uh, shirked any responsibilities. But I also added the responsibility of being out in the community and teaching and working with organizations. Mm -hmm. And that was different from the rest of the department aside from Stevens at that point? Uh, when you do social work, you do field education, so you get connected up with agencies and sometimes you do research with them or evaluation with them. So, it, But nobody really started anything out there. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever got engaged and, and had as much respect in the community as you did they did in the university. I probably have more in the community because mm -hmm. I speak English and try to help get things done and mm -hmm. in the university we speak uh, space-time continuum language and uh, talking street in the university doesn't go over very well. <laughs> but where I'm from, I'm from Utica, New York and you know we're it's a working class town and mm -hmm. I never lost my working class upbringing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not Southern, I'm from South Utica, New York. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm not Southern. And my friends are, Southern friends are not ashamed to say you aren't Southern. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, 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 on, it's on your inside, not where you were born. Right. And yeah. so, so, um, so you come here, it's a new department of social work. Do you start teaching right away? Did you get here in like the summer before the fall semester? Or? Oh man, it was crazy. Yeah? I had to teach three courses right out of the block. Yeah, like 100 level? No, 300 level. Mm -hmm. Intro, policy one, policy two, and then you did a field placement. You were supervising people out in the field. Okay. And I didn't have any of these courses done. I did teach at Duquesne while I was in Pittsburgh, so I had framework for a course, but it was a little bit more advanced than, because uh, it was in the graduate program there at Duquesne. Mm -hmm. And so I had to retool and revise everything. I got, oh, 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 there goes my therapy ball. I don't use this stuff anymore, but all of your old syllabus. All my old yellow papers and yeah. stuff like that. I, I wouldn't use them because mm -hmm. I lectured and I, I realized like about 25 years ago that I was a boring lecturer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you just get up there and you just talk. No, I started to read about education and started to engage the class mm -hmm. and um, showed videos on the big old clunker machines that we had. and The giant the, televisions or yeah. projectors. And I've evolved into trying to understand the millennials and how to co 
cordon off a course so that you don't get yawned all day. Yeah. <laughs> <And> <laughs> it's a particular kind of set of skills for that. Well, and they've been researched and mm -hmm. they, they work. They do. They work. I call it the yawn factor. I try to get through a whole class without a yawn. Mm. But you got to break it up. Yeah. you got to put them in groups, show a video, do a little bit of lecture, have them talk and engage. And mm. So you got here and you're teaching, but do you, um, you, if you're getting out of the community already, where are you getting out first? Well, when I got here, Ronald Reagan cut the budgets. Sure. And poor people were lining up at the armory to get surplus food. So mm. I was writing, I was beginning to write about, wow, what these cuts are doing to the people. And at the same time, I was working with agencies and organizations to, they were getting cut, mm -hmm. to how to retool. So I was on the board at the United Way. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I worked with Greensboro Urban Ministry and got fascinated by my wife who worked, ran a project at Urban Ministry called Project Independence which was using a refugee resettlement model, which I worked with the uh, Lutheran Family Services with a guy named Raleigh Bailey, who has started the Center for New North Carolinians, mm -hmm. which we were just friends and I was able to cook up uh, an appointment for him in our department, so he had a place for a desk. I, he, but he developed that, but I used to bring his agency and staff to class, my policy classes, and we would discuss the Refugee Resettlement Act, and I was an interactive community engaged. I was just everywhere. <laughs> just everywhere as, as far as you could possibly be. Well, it was a mess out there. It was yeah. like the Wild West when Reagan cut those budgets. Mm -hmm. I mean, we haven't seen anything since like that. And I felt, God, I got community organizing skills mm -hmm. on how to bring people people together. Uh, uh, let me offer what an academic that knows about this can offer. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, not mm -hmm. in the mind of people who are making decisions around here, sure. I was connected to the community. I was, I was a, the equivalent, a public intellectual writes a lot of stuff in the papers and things like that, but uh, an engaged scholar is just taking his or her wares out and trying to get organizations to become better at what they do because I'm reading about things and I'm following things on organizational development, congregations involved in community, and so I would bring what I knew out to the community and try to help them do better. Mm -hmm. So with all these cuts and um, this sort of like need for people to be doing these community engaged work, is there, is there like a rise in people looking to social, um, students going towards social work? Well, now we're off the charts. Back then, uh, we have to turn people away. Right. Back then, we were just getting departmental status. Mm -hmm. You could still have a college degree and you still can have a college degree and be called a social worker in, in state departments of social services because in rural counties, you can't get somebody who's often a trained social worker. So you gotta have somebody with a college degree. Mm -hmm. So the human service directors have been lobbying against having just to hire social workers because they can't get them. Mm -hmm be like a nurse practitioner versus a doctor or something out there. I guess, yeah. Uh, not exactly, but so, um, yeah, the question, did I, well, I forgot the question. Was there a rise in, P in students going towards social work? Increasingly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we used to have classes of 10, 12, 14, 20, 50, mm -hmm. then it got 50, you know, by my second decade in here. Mm -hmm there was a drop in the demographic. Mm -hmm. So what they asked me to do, because I got fairly good in the classroom, is to teach the intro class as a lure mm. to get people to become majors. Gotcha. And uh, so I, I taught intro for 15 years and then I hadn't taught it forever. Now that's all I do is teach intro. And I love it. Yeah. Okay. Well. What were some of your favorite classes to teach? Grant writing. Yeah? Yeah, I was on the board at the United Way in the 1980s, 81, 82, I think, and 83. Mm -hmm. And they had the Brian Venture Grant, and I chaired that committee. And 
grants would come in from agencies and there wouldn't be any programs inside the grant. It was kind of like just begging, give me money, we need it, there's a hole, we, we got to help these people. Mm -hmm. And you work with business people in these community uh, venture grants and they're, they're saying, I wouldn't give money to this, look at how lousy this budget is, there's no, no program plan here. Mm -hmm. And I said, hmm. I think I'll develop a course called Social Agency Program Development and wrap the course into writing a grant to develop a program. Mm -hmm. And that's been my signature course. I've done that for 25, 30 years now, mm -hmm. on and off, Yeah. to the point where I did it down at the Self-Help Center where there are 28 agencies right in the Self-Help Center. Mm -hmm. And I did it with my community partner, this, this guy right here, that guy. We, we were community mm -hmm. partners, still are, for since 1996. Mm -hmm. So he taught with me down there. So he taught with a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And it was a university-wide course. And then the politics of the university got such mm -hmm. that we weren't getting the FTEs in social work. Public health was getting them because we also had a public health professor. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if they're getting the FTEs and I design the course and I do all the work, and then they get the FTEs, let them teach it. Bye. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and I taught grant writing here. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so for the past three years, I've just been doing it in, in our department. But since all of our students are connected to agencies, it's still in real time. Mm -hmm. it's still, we're still doing the real work. That's good. Yeah. That's the important thing as it is anyway. Right. So the next question I have is about memorable projects in UNCG. And I have... Yeah, uh, inaugural director of community engaged scholarship. That wasn't my most memorable. That, okay, they told me to ask you about it. I'll, I'll get there. Okay. My most memorable is in 1982 or 1983, there was a rape on campus. And I was sitting there, and the students said to me, What are you going to do about it? What's this university going to do about it? I said, the university is going to do nothing about it. What are you going to do about it? Mm. So we marched our little behinds over to the new women's studies program. Mm -hmm. And they sat on the floor in there and listened and talked and listened and talked. Well, you see the lights on campus. Do you see the escort service on yeah. campus? You see the telephone things on the campus? Mm -hmm. That all came from that class. Oh, really? Evolved over the years. But mm -hmm. the pressure that was put on inside of the system by the constituents of the system mm -hmm. uh, made a large change. That was my most memorable engagement. The second most memorable engagement here on campus was I was a senator and they used to give us... The faculty senate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did it six years. I did it through two terms. Okay. See, so you were around for 38 years. You've done right. many, many things. Certain, yeah. And the parking on this campus in those days very much like today but a little bit softer they were like the KGB so they would come and if you parked illegally they'd tow you away mm. but what they were doing is towing people away at the night and they mostly were women students and they had to walk down Lee Street now Golden Gate Boulevard or Golden yeah. Gate City Boulevard. They had to walk down at night to get their car or call somebody to get their car. Scared the bejeebies out of them. Mm -hmm. So every Senate meeting we had 15 minutes. For, so for about four years, myself and a guy named Lloyd Bond, who's now emeritus at Stanford, but he was here at the time, we would stand up and talk about it and sign peti get petitions going to get these guys to be more human. Mm -hmm. and, they, uh, and one of my letters to the Chancellor, I wish I had it, I said, you guys got to remember that everybody you tow here today and scare them is an alum in the future and their biggest memory is going to be about you guys towing them and they were scared and there goes your money mm -hmm. and that was a sort of weird concept to these guys because they're law and order parking people right yeah you know. which chancellor was this Moran. Okay. And it rolled into Sullivan because they didn't, so then they started booting. Mm. And then they started doing warnings at the beginning of the semester because new people on campus didn't really get where to park and they were scared and they ran to classes. Right. 
and they finally started to get a sense that, oh, this is a community here. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to soften up. Mm -hmm. And so now you'll get booted. You won't get towed until you've been booted twice. Mm -hmm. But that's my most memorable. Now we can go to the community engagement. <laughs> okay, so the because this is my community. Yeah, this is this is my home. Right. So, you know, you got to clean up at home too before you can go out and change the community. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So now you want to talk about the community engaged scholarship. Yeah, there was no such thing as community engaged scholarship. There was only scholarship. Right. And increasingly, as we became corporatized, the way you since you couldn't get down in the trenches and really understand people's work outside of the department. At the macro level, the increasingly further away people who judge this stuff got from the work, the more they would just count numbers. Mm -hmm. So you had to X publications, Y publications. Well, we as a department went along with that. But the reality of community-engaged scholarship, if I were a biologist or a chemist and they were going to hire me in, one of the incentives would be to help set up my lab mm -hmm. and perhaps a graduate student. Sure. Well, when you're an engaged scholar, you come to a new town, you have to go out and develop relationships in agencies and organizations. You have to develop trust. And then perhaps you may offer up to do a little evaluation two years in after building all these relationships. So you're hustling to get a, a, a publication. Maybe you'll talk a little bit about the history of your relationship in the community, but you don't have any data. Mm -hmm. You don't have any data. So the only thing that was the same in promotion and tenure between a biologist and a community engaged scholar was the six years mm -hmm. that you had. Right. So over the years I packed away and packed away and packed away at changing the promotion and tenure guidelines because it was like measuring apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. the, the, the scholars of what we called discovery, as I said, thought that the work you do out in the community is like serving soup. Mm -hmm. But you could have never called my plumber to do some of the work that I did with some of these organizations and help building their infrastructure. Right. And an engaged scholar's work is zigs and zags and nobody ever accounts for the time that it takes to build the relationship in the community. So Lori Sims and HES, the dean, mm -hmm. saw this effort and wanted to start getting some of her faculty recognized. So she made me the director of community engaged scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Celia came in, she asked me if I wanted to head up a committee. I said, no, I'm already the director. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And that's when I went about develop. I thought I was going to be in the position for a long time. So I went about developing the program the way I thought it ought to be developed mm -hmm. based on data. Mm -hmm. So I surveyed all the faculty in HHS mm -hmm. and we have a lot of social scientists who know about survey methods but they didn't sort of like mine. I, I like I like to have almost a complete population study so I got 87 percent or over 80, 85 mm -hmm. percent response rate from the 130 faculty. Mm -hmm. But I had the dean robocall the faculty the <laughs> night before. Sure. <laughs> and that pissed off a lot of people. That made me, that turned me into a junior <laughs> leaguer. I didn't care. I wanted the data. Right. But that turned me into a junkyard dog mm -hmm. as a researcher and, you know, robocall. Yeah. Well, I didn't care about the robocall. I wanted, I wanted to know who, how many, and what departments, what rank were people engaged, mm -hmm. and how were they engaged. I got some beautiful data. 87% mm -hmm. of the faculty in this school are affiliated with an agency and organization on various levels, from working on their governance structure to helping them write grants. And that took me a good solid year and change to get that data, to analyze that data, and then because she didn't give me a staff, right. so I had to beg, borrow, and steal uh, statistical help mm -hmm. and do the analysis with somebody else, and, and finally I had it in my head where, where we ought to be headed. 
not beheaded, headed, mm -hmm. but where we ought to be heading. Mm -hmm. And by that time, the other forces in public health really wanted to take over community engagement. They didn't care about doing it the right way. They cared about owning the title because mm -hmm. public health is supposed to be out in the community, right. not social work, like really collecting data right. and doing stuff. So it was a really interesting political yeah. dynamic that took place. So I lasted for three years in there, and, mm -hmm. and then uh, I'll never forget, the dean showed me the survey that she sent out, and two people said that they didn't know what I was doing Three quarters of the responses were saying that they did and it was good, and she, because of the two, she told me that uh, my position was ended. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the politics of the university. There's right. got nothing. The uni university's like theater. Uh huh. It creates its own mythology and its own reality. So when people walk in, they take on a role, and if there's a bully in a department and the dean's not as strong as the bully or the department is theoretically the big money winner, then they get to, to kind of call the shots of how the rhythm of the school works. It's not necessarily based on truth. Hmm. And my truth simply has been, I'm an employee of the state of North Carolina and I'm here to teach young people to do the best thinking they possibly can do mm -hmm. and to provide my knowledge for the community and the rest of it is fiction mm -hmm. so you just do what you were doing yeah, yeah and that's why people in the community like me a whole lot better than this new generation of student uh, of faculty really like me mm -hmm. the old generation really thought i was just nothing yeah just going about things the wrong except way except i got a lot of money well <laughs> so so they were confused and upset yeah right and i got <laughs> money from places that uh, um, like the Lilly Endowment mm -hmm. for religion because I study how congregations contribute to public life mm -hmm. and was funded by them for 10 years. Well, nobody over there in the religion department could get Lilly grants. So I was like a high school class president getting grants before we had a grant office right. and at the same time how could that dumb guy over in social work be getting Lilly grants? Yeah. So, so it was a kind of weird relationship that I had with everybody. But yeah. So be it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other memorable projects you want to talk about? Oh, God, yeah. Well, we can go through Our uh, Health and Faith Summit that we did at Mount Zion Baptist Church. We, mm -hmm. uh, My community partner, we developed, a non, we developed a $100 million nonprofit organization that we put people to work and we started documenting in 2006. We started in 96, but we really started documenting in 2006. So we documented putting a thousand people to work. Mm -hmm. People that were on the system, mm -hmm. off the system, into jobs, changed their lives. Right. But, and every year we, every other year we would do a summit on poverty. So we did 16 summits. Uh, and we did two in a row, the Health Faith Summit, which was our biggest draw over at Mount Zion, and we had 760 people, and summit's different from a conference. Right. You gather all the people who are smart in a particular area in the community, and they develop the workshops and teach people and teach okay. each other. So it takes eight or nine months to, yeah, to plan. I bet. And so we had tremendous coverage. We had the White House here. And my colleague and I became consultants for the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships under Obama. Mm -hmm. And then we did one on mental health where we outed uh, mental illness in the center of town. And that's when I was asked to be um, visiting scholar and religion at Greensboro College. Mm -hmm. And Odell, my colleague, looked and said, Wine, what do you see? He, call, he calls me Wine. Mm -hmm. I said, I see the Jefferson Building. He says, exactly. This is the center of town. This is where we're going to do the summit. Mm -hmm. Let's see if our model works outside of the church. And sure. we were able to get close to 500 people there. Wow. And uh, the best part of it is our speaker, who was self-described uh, schizophrenic and psychotic mm -hmm. on meds, and he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge but lived and it was a dynamic spe speaker. We had somebody who was mentally ill get a standing ovation in the center of Greensboro. That was the metaphor that I thought was, wow, what an accomplishment. Right. And 
that was working with my community partner, that was working with Greensboro College, that was working with UNCG. We couldn't have, we bust everybody from up at those parking decks. It was a, it was a, a, a train, a German train system that we, we had it down to a science. That was one of my uh, happiest engaged moments. Yeah, that sounds very impressive. And we videoed, uh, we, ra we raised the money mm -hmm. and uh, I, I begged and development and the school got really pissed off at me because they're supposed to raise money. Mm. And I wasn't going to sit around waiting for them to come up with a system and an approach and flowers and fancy letters to people and then another meeting and a lunch and then the ask. The, the time would have been over. So I, I, uh, I raised the money for that and raised enough money to video about 15 of the 21 sessions that we have. And I use it for class and I've sent it to other people to use for class because we cut the videos to 15, 16 minutes, good talking points. Sure. So those those were my accomplishments. And you see the community teaching yeah. and I bring the community into my class and they teach. So yeah. I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. But not many people know about it because sure. it's not in their educational bailiwick. Mm. But those 450 people that showed up, they they knew. That. The mental health community knew, the mm -hmm. faith community knew, and that's all I cared. Yeah, it's the important about. people anyway. Right. Um, so the next question I have is what changes under the Department of Social Work during your, what change has occurred under the Department of Social Work during your time here? Well, I was hired here for the Joint Master's Program in Social Work, but it took about seven years. The racial stuff between UNCG and A&T was horrible. Mm. And I'm not going to lay the blame on either side. Uh, both sides deserve equal blame for putting their institutional interests ahead of what could have been a signature program that could have been showcased around the country for innovation in helping solve, manage, and prevent some of the major problems that we have in this community. But we never put social work first. Mm -hmm. We put race and our institutional interests first. Mm -hmm. And it, I got out of that thing and uh, never looked back until... Um, they asked me to teach in it once in a while when accreditation came around because the people that do my stuff were always getting complained about. But when mm -hmm. accreditors come around, you don't want to hear student complaints. You want students. So they'd ask me right. to teach the administration course during the time of accreditation. <laughs> but then they switched they, and they went to become therapists. And the reason they won't say this, nobody will say this, people weren't passing the licensure exam. Mm. So what they decided to do is go completely therapeutic and add more therapeutic courses. The problem is we didn't have the guns for it. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have the people to do it, so we had to farm out in the community to get adjuncts to teach the courses that were supposed to be the core of our curriculum, right. where you get the stars to teach that stuff. Yeah. And my daughter happened to go to, uh, while well, this was all going on, my wife is a clinical therapist who goes to a gazillion workshops and things like that. And my daughter went to Smith College for social work. And she passed that test with flying colors because the curriculum prepared her for it. Mm -hmm. These guys, you gotta get a better faculty <laughs> to, to pass the test. And they have course, they had a course now to how to take the exam. and. Like teaching a course to the test, the curriculum is supposed to do that. And I, as you can tell by now, I speak my piece. Mm -hmm. And I said it was a bad idea. And when you say something's a bad idea to people in two schools, and they buy into the idea, and you keep saying it's not a good idea, it's not going to work real well, you, you become toxic. Yeah. They're not toxic. I was toxic. <laughs> And I still believe the same way, mm -hmm. that everything is going on out in the community and we're wasting a lot of energy teaching people how to sit them in a chair like you and I are doing and fix their problem mm -hmm. as opposed to working with the systems to fix the problem. Yeah. Now I'm going a little overboard here. We have an incredible program called the Congregational Social Work Initiative where we get people 
in the master's program out in agencies working with nurses, congregational nurses, to help broker services that nurses don't know how to do while the congregational nurses are, are cutting the cost of the hospital by doing in-home or in-congregational nursing. Mm -hmm. So that is a terrific program that we've done for 10 years here. And they still have the students take the clinical track, but a lot of their work is the kind of work that I consider community work. Gotcha. Okay. So that's, that's a difference and that's a sort of shift over time through the department that it ended up. Yes. And we got, uh, uh, we're up to about $3 million in this HRSA grant to get social workers out in the community. They're still taking the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Like there's a whole bunch of courses that you can learn, like program development. Right. Nobody, nobody in the master's program takes my grant writing class. Mm -hmm. Agencies are getting pummeled out there. Yeah. And I've got one master's student in social work taking my course. Wow. When I taught at school-wide, I had doctoral students mm -hmm. and public health students and nutrition students. And, but here in social work, there's still that stay away from him. Mm -hmm. We've got this curriculum to do. We've got to make sure that they get licensure. And that's just a peripheral course, even though the reality says, God, wouldn't it be something if somebody got out of social work and came into an agency who had a caseload, but also could sit down and conceptualize and write a grant mm -hmm. to, to grow a program. And yeah. that's not where they're at right now. Right. They're focusing on the, not the whole illness, but just like one particular part of it. Right. In their head, they know that things are connected. Right. There's the person and the environment. But to have the skills to change the environment, yeah, they don't want to take my course. And that saddens me. Yeah. Um, any other changes in department of social work? Or, um, or should we move on to when you were chair? Well, the, change, the, the broad changes now is that uh, I've outlived my second set of enemies in this university. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got millennials or Xers who really believe in engagement and bigger picture stuff here. So things are changing uh, tremendously. It's a wonderful atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I that, love it. Yeah, and it's much better now in that sense. Yeah, I can die now. <laughs> Satisfied. <laughs> Not during your birthday week. You have a bit more to go. <laughs> No, I still have a lot of energy. Yeah, and plenty more to do, I'm certain. I do. Um, so, and then you were the guy left in the room and became chair of the social work department. I became chair of the social work department, and I did it for five years. Mm -hmm. And we were the people. I was a founder of the, the master's program. I okay. brought the documents down mm -hmm. to Chapel Hill and sat around with the 16... Uh, graduate deans with my colleague Sarah Kirk at A&T and Sarah didn't do a lot of work mm. on this and we used to meet over at the city club and one day I said she's sitting there taking a lot of credit for all of this mm. and finally it, I said do you call something equal when somebody does 80% of the work and somebody does 20% of the work and I got called a racist in front of everybody there and I left the room almost crying, and I quit the chair right that following summer. I said, I'm not coming back, because I'm not going to be called something that I'm not. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody would say everybody's racist, but you can see my colleague, the Reverend Odell Cleveland. We worked for 22 years together on a regular basis, and he said to me, and I quote, Why? If you're racist, I'm white. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't believe that I was called that. Mm -hmm. But that's... That's how the game got played for a long time in developing this program. That's why, why it went nowhere. Right. And it limped along, and every other white savior came in and thought that they could, uh, you know, win with A and T. Finally, we got the right formula, and that was that we hired uh, somebody, a black guy, who got tenure at A and T and tenure here, Jeff mm -hmm. Shears, mm -hmm. and that changed the nature of the communication back and forth between the universities. Huh. We okay. should have had that from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, you should have. Yeah. So, uh, I love being the chair. I love, I hired many of the people that turned out to be chairs in this department. And uh, uh, I loved it, but I could not think of myself walking in and out of meetings, in and out of meetings, developing this master's program 
with that cloud hanging over my head. Mm -hmm. They didn't. They weren't thinking it. They said it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. And then I hunkered down with my scholarship, and it turned out to be the best thing. Yeah. So my next set of questions are about um, chancellors here that you've worked under. So you came in under Moran? I did. I was uh, interviewed by Stan Jones, who was the vice chancellor f f under Ferguson. Under Ferguson, okay. And I ended up on a committee with Ferguson, a real gentleman mm -hmm. and kind. But my first academic chancellor was William Moran. Mm -hmm. We both came in at the same time. Right. And so what were your impressions of Moran? He was strictly corporate. Strictly corporate, and like I wrote you in the email, mm -hmm. he was given a charge to turn this into a male-dominated university. Get more men on campus, we'll get more science, we'll get more sports, we will become like the other universities in the system, mm -hmm. recognized not for our girl tradition, but for our science penis, mm -hmm. our sports prowess. Mm -hmm. It worked like we still got 66% women here yeah, on campus. Yeah. And my argument the whole time was is that we had a powerful, powerful women's tradition here. And in social work, one of the principles that we're often taught, whether it's whether you work with an organization or an individual, is that you start building off their strengths. You don't try to fix all the weaknesses, you try to build off strengths. And they saw women's weakness and they tried to build off of strengthen the male part of it and never really worked right and uh, that was Moran in a, in a nutshell he mm -hmm. did everything in his power to corporatize systematize and turn us into a, a guy school what what were his methods we would get memos from his buddy his guy Fred Drake mm -hmm. Uh, they signed a contract with Barnes and Nobles and they told us that we couldn't buy books at Adam Bookstore. Mm. Those were the methods. Yeah. Corporate. Yeah. This is how you're supposed to behave. Well, I, like I told you, I, I work for the students in North Carolina, not Bill Moran. Right. <laughs> so he did some stupid things. He fired the housekeepers because of Fred Drake. They wanted to privatize the housekeeping staff. So they, right in the middle of the semester, they uh, changed the time that they had to arrive on campus. They had to arrive on campus at 5.30. They used to have to arrive at when the first bus got here, which was 6. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they were getting demerits and things like that. So I put, brought together a group of faculty members and challenged them for nine months. Because mm -hmm. there's no union. They didn't have a union. Right. And the, uh, Marion Wright Edelman has a saying. Are you familiar with Marion Wright Edelman? I, I'm not. She's the head of the Children's Defense Fund. Okay. And a great American lobbyist for children. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, a bunch of fleas can't kill a mean dog, but sure can make them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I made Moran uncomfortable with emails and letters all the time mm -hmm. about how unjust that was to screw these uh, housekeepers. Mm -hmm. I kept saying, look, they clean our toilets. <laughs> and you're being mean to them? Yeah. And, but they, they thought in terms of finance. So if you contract out housekeeping, then it would save money so that they could put into uh, the new soccer stadium or their baseball Something. stadium. Yeah. And they didn't like the flea. Mm -hmm. And that right there, that, that's, a, that's a Sullivan era, but that's the type that was, you know, I wasn't afraid to say things in public. I believed in seeking and speaking the truth. That was in the handbook the first day I got here, seek and seek to seek and speak the truth. Mm -hmm. So I did. And, and not being arrogant or anything, right. there's just a lot of bullshit that goes on in the university. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, it's 40 to 1, but yeah. I, I hung in there. Sure. And then after Moran was with Sullivan. Sullivan. <laughs> I really respected her and liked her a lot. Mm -hmm. She didn't like me personally because I challenged her and I wrote stuff in the paper and I challenged her in the Senate. But mm -hmm. I never saw, I don't see any of this stuff 
as personal. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Right. I believe that honorable people can disagree. And if you have the right for free speech, then you can exercise it. People should praise you for the free speech and get mad at you for your idea, get mad that I don't agree with your ideas, but you're not a bad human being. Well, that's not the way these things played out. Right. So Sullivan was a terrific, she lobbied like hell for this university. She was a great politician. And she got a little bloody nose with, when she tried to get come in at first and just knock down the building. And it was for what Moran was doing. It was to have an entrance for Barnes and Noble huh. to the bookstore. Right. They were going to knock down the um, Chancellor building. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see where the entrance is. That's where it was. Right. So that's what this was all about. This was not about student education. Mm -hmm. This was about corporatism. Mm -hmm. This was not about faculty rights, which mm -hmm. I told, started off the conversation about. This was about, I'm the boss. And the faculty stood up to her, and I kicked it off, but I wouldn't say then everybody coalesced around right. that building. And, and actually, it worked out for the best. Mm -hmm. But you need to explain that entire story for the recording, because we've like chatted about it off camera and off the recording. Well, Sullivan and her minions decided through backdoor channels that there was going to be a book entrance to Barnes and Noble. And one day I wake up in the morning and I read about it in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And then she had uh, she called the meeting and explained it all to the faculty. And I'm seething inside, and so were a whole bunch of other faculty members, and so were a bunch of historic preservationists, because the building is one of five by this famous architect who I could name, because <laughs> I didn't care about the architect. Right. And we, we started talking, and I was stewing and stewing and stewing. We had a faculty son meeting, and uh, when it was faculty time, I got up and read that letter. Mm -hmm. And it started the ball rolling, and then community groups asked me to come out and speak. The League of Women Voters asked me to come and speak to their meeting about it. And I didn't pretend for a second I cared about the architecture. Mm -hmm. I cared about the lack of community. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another, and Preservation North Carolina put some money in to upfit the building. The prior family gave a million dollars to build and help move the building. And so, and all of the preservationists were real happy because the building was going to be saved and it turned into be our welcome center. Mm -hmm. And so what started out to be administrative fiat turned out to be a good fundraiser, a good community building thing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's what happens when you become an autocrat, mm -hmm. that you throw away the other possibilities of what good minds can do when you give them an opportunity to work together. Right. And I just went after her autocracy. Mm -hmm. And as the picture shows, I won. <laughs> you did. And, I, and she never really liked me for it mm -hmm. because her chief fundraiser was an, an alum and she happened to be one of my favorite students. And so she asked me to give the speech when she was named junior alum of the year. Mm -hmm. And I talked about what an angel she was because she babysat for my kids and if you trust somebody babysitting for your kids, you know that they've got a soul. Mm -hmm. And Sullivan came up afterwards and in between Michelle and myself, a woman whose name was Michelle Snyder, she says, oh, you are human after all. Mm. But she was a tough, thick-skinned biologist from New York City, from New York with no children, and she was hard-nosed, and this university became her sort of family and child, and that's who she advocated for. So if somebody like me went after what she thought was good business, she could see me as not human, but she, one of the board members was a friend of mine, and she called me her problem child. Mm. And I, first of all, I never considered myself a child here. I'm a, a scholar. Mm -hmm. 
and so she wanted that's that's how you undo people in the university and talk about them but the building is still there so <laughs> my ego's not that hurt right the building is still there mm -hmm. Otherwise, I thought she was a terrific. She she gave the Center for New North Carolinian a boost like you wouldn't believe, yeah. and she advocated it. Now we've got our own place on campus. So just because she went after me a little bit doesn't mean that she wasn't a terrific administrator and advocate for this university. Mm -hmm. And she deserves the building over there. I don't care how much she left. Her work, mm -hmm. her legacy is worth having a building in her name. Definitely. And then was Brady, was who we had after her. Brady? Yeah. Well, whoever looks at this in the history is going to know that, I call it like it is, she was completely incapable of running a hot dog stand, let alone the university. Hmm. Okay. She had no personality. She did not know how to connect with the people. She got a, a mandate from whomever that it's the new normal. We're in the recession. She's going to cut back programs. Had people doing assessments uh, with the underlying uh, narrative that there's going to be changes made here, and which meant cuts. And it was just a lousy atmosphere with her. And then she uh, brought in a new kind of PR guy, a guy named Mason, I think his name was. And he, she basically told him to clean up that office there, advancement office there. And so they found him doing some stupid things like uh, working on their own time, doing photography and making some money on their own time. Because uh, they were not, a, they were salaried people. So you, sometimes salary, like I worked all weekend this weekend on my classes. Mm -hmm. If if I were on salary, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But I didn't work a whole lot yesterday. I read my novel because mm -hmm. Monday I taught twelve hours. Sure. Right? I taught two classes, and I was here for a candidate and stuff. The hours just don't work out when you're are you salaried or hour, hourly hourly you're hourly so when you're off the clock you're off the clock yeah not when you hear Brady so Brady fired those people and with stupid claims and then plastered in the newspaper the picture of Lida Carpin uh, that she cheated in the university that woman was about as much a cheat as Jesus is a cheat she no cheat Brady was just nasty mm -hmm. and she set a tone here is and it, it filtered through you know, sometimes the organization was the goals of the few, and the organization become the goals of the many. Mm -hmm. And the mean-spirited, carrot-stick uh, tenor of behavior turned this increasingly more into a, a scared corporation as opposed to an academic institution where you wake up in the morning and love to get in your class and then love to walk outside and love to see your colleagues. All the scuttlebutt was, what is the wicked witch of the East going to do today? Mm. So I wrote a letter, an op-ed in the paper. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys got that or not. I think we, I don't remember if we do or not. I'll check with Scott. So that letter, the subtext of it was more important than what I said in than the text. The text? Uh -huh. Yeah, I was only given 800 words. I got credits a mile long down at the bottom. It says Jefferson Pilot Excellence Professor, Fulbright Scholar, mm -hmm. uh, Scholarship and Only Living Professor. Doesn't say only, mm -hmm. only Living Professor, but I am the only living professor who has a scholarship in his name that I didn't endow. Mm -hmm. There's another guy that in computer science that's an excellence professor, but he put a chunk of change in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they said, well, you don't need to have all that. I said, they'll take my excellence professor away in a minute. They'll take it away in a minute. I said, I, you've got to make them wrestle through the fact that it wasn't some stumble bum that wrote this thing. Mm -hmm. 
because despite what the word on the street here is in the university, I'm a, a top scholar. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know what they say about humility, once you recognize it, you lost it. Mm -hmm. But I don't go running around saying that I am, but I had to put those credits up there mm -hmm. so that because those are our values. We want people to be authors and have scholarships named after them because they're good teachers mm -hmm. and be uh, recognized as one of the top performers. This is what the goal of everybody that walks in here right. is. They can't stab that to get to me. Mm -hmm. And Doug Clark didn't get that at the paper. And he said, I said, if they come after me, what are you going to do? And he said, we'll back you 100%. Mm -hmm. So he put all those credits in, and it, it really is hard to, he just can't say, oh, you're, you're a lousy scholar, you got three books or four books in a place where citizenship counts. You can't, you can't do that. Administrators can't say that about me. They, mm -hmm. can't say, they might say he's got a big mouth, but they can't say he doesn't produce. Mm -hmm. So what do you want from a faculty? Right. Good teacher, scholarly production, money, mm -hmm. or can you put up with a big mouth? Now, if I had big nut mouth and none of that other stuff, that'd be different. Yeah. <laughs> so, did that answer your question about um, Brady? Brady Brady was awful. <laughs> I just I couldn't. Not as a human being. I've been at a bunch of meetings with her, and we sat, we chatted. She's a nego negotiator with the Russians. Mm -hmm. She said she couldn't get tenure if she weren't engaged when she was at Vanderbilt. I don't hate any of these people because this is theater here. It's not personal. It's And it's theater. When you walk in, everybody plays a role. Mm -hmm. And so I don't hate anybody. Mm -hmm. And then we come to our current uh, Gilliam Jr. I find him fascinating. Really? Yeah, he read the tea leaves very well. Mm -hmm. He came in and put himself on a golf cart and just drove around campus shaking people's hands, but trying to get a feel in his gut what this place was really all about. Mm -hmm. And I think he's got an incredible vision about what's going on in the community. However, he's not touchy-feely and out there with faculty and stuff like that, for at least for the first three years. Dana Dunn has been implementing all of his stuff mm -hmm. from my perch, mm -hmm. and other people are, and it seems to be going in a direction that I'm pretty happy with. Okay. Um, you know, this is a yeah. that's a twenty thousand member town, right? And so you just can't can't nail it all in one swath. I mean, sure, I could be a nitpicker and pick out some things I don't like, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, I like I thought I liked Moran personally because we were in so many meetings together. <laughs> uh, I, Sullivan and I. I liked her, she didn't like me, so we didn't have any time. Brady I liked sort of personally, mm -hmm. but I thought she did the worst job. And Gilliam I don't know very well. He actually knows my community partner Odell Cleveland better than he, he knows me, because mm -hmm. Odell is the second in command at Mount Zion, which is the largest black church from D.C. to Atlanta. Right. So with his community stuff that Gilliam is doing, he needs Odell, because Odell is very prominent in the community. Right. That makes sense. So. Odell talks to him more than I do. Yeah, that's okay though. Um, so my next question is, uh, do you have any thoughts about any other administrators during your time here? I love Alan Boyette. Mm -hmm. I think he's the most honest person uh, that could be in a position that feeds information to the chancellor and to the provost. He's, he's honest whether they implement his honesty is secondary. Mm -hmm. He's honest. Right. Ed U. Pritchard was about as moral as you can get. He was a provost. Mm -hmm. And he actually stewed on how to do the right thing within the context of that no matter what you do in a place like this, you're a shooting target, so you're a dartboard. Mm -hmm. And U. Pritchard tried to get as close to the bullseye with the right thing as much as he could. Mm -hmm. And he was Sullivan's... Uh, Chancellor, and they worked well together. Mm -hmm. Two Catholics from uh, Long Island and Waspy, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> so was Moran. I mean, sure. we've had a lot of Catholics here. Yeah. And um, any other thoughts about f other chairs of social work while you were here? John Reif right. was efficient, effective, 
anti disagreements and stuff but we kind of cruised along but a lot of shit was taking place behind the scenes uh, we had a couple EEOC suits because he didn't just didn't want to deal with the the mess that was uh -huh. underneath the sea. We just, what if, suits? EEOC e suits. EEOC Yeah. What does that stand for? Equal Employment Opportunity okay. Commission. In other words, it's discrimination, whether it's age, race, <laughs> stuff like that. Gotcha. And uh, one was dropped, one was won. Mm -hmm. And that was under his watch. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was... I kind of got handed over under the Lindsay, Betsy Lindsay, and I didn't, John I worked with fine, I, I could not work with Betsy Lindsay. Mm -hmm. I asked the dean to get somebody else to supervise me. Mm -hmm. And that's when I became director of community engagement, so they kind of gave me that title so that they could keep the... Keep that away. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and then... Amy. Now, I love Betsy, don't get me wrong. Okay. We chat and stuff. Uh, we're friends. We email back and forth. We both got back problems. When they got in their role as boss, I disagreed with that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't disagreeable with them as people. I was disagreeable with their ideas. Mm -hmm. And that is a very hard thing to do. Yeah. And even in a university is to say, you're a fine person. I would hate those ideas. I'll fight against those ideas. Mm. And it didn't work like that. It worked like it was personal with them, and they were. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Hmm. Yeah. And so the next question is: um, colleagues who've made an impression on you here at the whole university? Yeah. Terry Nile, Rob Cannon, Henry Levinson. Um, Joe Limonstall, um, Melissa Floyd Pickard, my chair now, <laughs> the, the Yarnesia Dyson, Danielle Swick, Meredith Powers, these, and Tanya Coakley, these young Tyressa Washington are all out there doing stuff. They're doing stuff. They've made such an impression. It's kind of like you know you you're in battle and you're 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 wounded and you're walking around with wounds and then all of a sudden somebody comes up with miracle salve and <laughs> that's what we've got here now <laughs> daniel rhodes raleigh bailey uh um marianne lagreco i mean just people that are the next generation uh deb cassidy oh my god let me, let me go off on deb cassidy here okay. for a second are you familiar with our child care center? Um, I've passed it, I think. Our child, well, that's the child yeah. care center, but that, it's a huge research operation. Okay. And our part of human development family studies has the child, the applied part. And Deb Cassidy was the director of that and brought millions and millions of dollars in. Because of bad framing, we called this the, what it did ever is part of child development. The fact of the matter is, is that it is the research and development arm of the child care industry in North Carolina because it gives all the cert certifications for each child care center. Okay. And they develop the protocols for it. They do the research. They do the certification. And so this is, let me go back to where we started. Mm -hmm. Had Moran and then Sullivan had the eyeglasses to see this as an economic development piece that women can actually do, we would have a big, huge center right now as opposed to a, a brand new school, uh, education, I shouldn't say, but, but uh, soccer stadiums and mm -hmm. baseball. We would have pumped our energy and our institutional brains mm -hmm. into developing this industry. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of things that they just missed. Yeah. They missed. And I've been trying to convince these guys in there now, Linda Heston is, call it the child care uh, industries research and development arm. Call it that. Mm -hmm. it, talk about its economic development and all the people that you keep employed and if they don't behave themselves in those centers that you're, you're making the families better by upholding the standards. But we're still in that corporate this is still a women's right. school. Hmm. 
do you get what I have meant now by the yeah. not building off the strengths? Yeah, I do. So I just wanted to make sure it was explained in like a narrative as we were going through. Okay. That's all it is. But you said Danielle was working on that? I don't know. Linda Heston Lin- and, and, and her crew. Mm-hmm. She's got a partner there, but since Deb died, I, I kind of felt weird being around that department. I, I love Deb Cassidy. Mm-hmm. I just loved her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are some great, great, great people here. Ken Keneva, another one. He helped write the promotion and tenure document for engaged scholarship, and he was completely against it when he started. You turned him? I didn't turn him. Good ideas turned him. Good scholars, when you see, you've got you, you got to be able to change your mind if you the data shows that your mind wasn't in the right direction. And Ken was that wise, was that good of a scholar. Mm-hmm. So he ended up writing the document. Nice to have the enemy write the document. Yeah. So, uh, and a good example of that is that we were in the, see, I was on the promotion tenure committee here in first HES, School Mm -hmm. of Human and Environmental Sciences. Mm -hmm. And then for a year bridging when we became a school of health. But I wrote the documents. I worked with the university lawyers. Uh, and then because I was the chair for so many years, the University of Promotion and Tenure Committee took three years to write the engaged measures and engagement into our document. But most of the schools rotated either the chair would rotate a year. It's a hard work to be the chair. Right. And it was an elected position. And nobody ran the first year and somebody said, would, would you run? I said, yeah. And then nobody ran the second year, and they said, would you run? I said, yeah. And then by the third year, I was learning about the guts of this, and I was involved with the lawyer, and I said, okay, yeah, I'll do it. And then every year, they'd they'd say, are are you going to run again? Mm -hmm. And and nobody ran against me. So I ended up doing it for 13 years. (laughs) And I learned a lot about how the bowels of the university work. Mm -hmm. Because when you write promotion and tenure documents and you sit in those meetings and you review dossiers and you review what departments say about people and then you're on the university tenure promotion tenure committee, you get to meet the other people in other schools and you get to know the narrative, you get to know the, the balls. Mm-hmm. So Ken was the College of Arts and Sciences chair one year, the final year that we got this stuff in. And we were screaming at each other in a meeting. But Ken's an Italian from downstate New York and I'm mm-hmm. Jew from upstate New York mm-hmm. and so the flailing of the hands and, yeah. and and arguing with people is and Ken and I are we're personal friends we're family friends mm-hmm. so we get done screaming at each other in this meeting mm-hmm. and it's really against the tenor of UNCG to scream at anybody in a meeting sure but this was over a really important issue that he was saying that that engaged scholarships bullshit mm-hmm. And then we walk out, and he puts his arm around me, and we're giggling, we're laughing. <laughs> so one of the faculty members in nursing saw me walking up this ab here from the parking deck past the nursing school. She goes, I can't believe that the two of you had your arms around each other after what he said to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I look at her, it was, her name was Trish. I said, Trish, this wasn't personal. Mm -hmm. This was about two differing sets of ideas about what scholarship is. Ken and I are friends. (laughs) But she thought it was the worst thing that could have happened on earth. But then once Ken was convinced that, oh yeah, this is engaged scholar. It's different from me going to the library and looking up some 18th century technological scientist and tracing. It's different. Mm And it takes more time, and it is scholarship. And then he is so brilliant that he was cutting and pasting without a computer. Just mm-hmm. look at the documents and say, oh, that's got to be moved there, that's yeah. got to be moved there. And he was basically responsible for getting the narrative in there correctly. Wow. Very impressive. Yeah, it was. Uh, but th- that was the 13 years that I was in the trenches. Mm-hmm. 
um, allowed me to be on that committee for three years. So I was the only co committee member that had the continuity and, and could kind of hold it. I think uh, Lori Kennedy Malone was on there for three years as well. She she was another person I really loved. Lori Kennedy Malone, mm -hmm. stalwart in community engagement, probably one of the, the hidden figures in community engagement, looked throughout all the tenure documents in the whole country to try to figure out what it ought to be here. She should get three stars. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. My others, mm -hmm. Andrea Hunter. I love Andrea Hunter. Do you know Andrea? I don't. Human Development, Family Studies, um, switched to becoming a kind of narrative writer, switched from the social science about black families. And her narratives, she, her, she's such a, she, she's, I told her, I said, Andrew, you're from another planet, you're from another time, you're so soulful. And so she, she switched her academic, not career, but the way she does research from social science studies to kind of writing histories, mm. family histories, and in, in, in a narrative style, huh. connecting to the social, economic, and political rhythm of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just love her. A lot of people, I love UNCG. I've loved the students. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorites there, Stacy. Mm -hmm. She was the one, Stacy uh, Galligan Vogel, she was instrumental in starting the Weinberg scholarship, but she was the young woman that said, what are we going to do about this mm. with the rape? Mm -hmm. And there she was sitting on the floor, and yeah. now she's a big donor to the university. But she started the Weinberg scholarship. Wow. That's when I had cancer, and she said, well, geez, I don't want to acknowledge him when he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, acknowledge him while he's here. Yeah, yeah. so, um, yeah, Michelle Schneider, mm -hmm. who raised funds for this place. Um, Bob Griffiths in political science from my hometown. Uh, Ruth DeHoe, instrumental in starting nonprofit. There's just a lot of people I really, really, really like here. A yeah. lot. Good. So yeah. it's not. I'm, I might be perceived by some administrators as a big bad wolf, but I'm not. Terry Shelton. Uh, mm. I think she's one of the smartest people on the planet. I don't agree with the directions that she's gone in, but she started real research out in the community with the Center for Children and Families and evolved to become a, a muckety-muck here. Mm -hmm. I like her a lot. Mm -hmm. I like Celia, my dean. Mm -hmm. uh, I like her more as a, a friend than an administrator, but I like her. So yeah, uh, did that did answer your question? I, I just don't want you to forget anybody. I was going to let you keep going. Oh my God, Harriet Kupfer. Oh, Harriet Kupfer. She was one of the, she was an anthropologist and she, I wrote my first paper in a journal called Public Welfare. So I gave it to her to review. She beat the shit out of it. Oh my God, I hadn't had a critique like that. Even my doctoral dissertation advisor didn't beat me up like that. Oh, she kicked me from one end of the way. And her message was, Weinberg, you ain't smart. You're still young and you've got a lot to learn. And boy, every time I saw her, I just kind of said, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, Harriet Kupfer, woof. Yeah, that's about, that. I, mean, I mean, I can name others, but okay. those are the ones that popped in my head. Okay. So um, the next question, uh, question was um, any sort of, uh, could you get any sense of what campus culture is like as a professor? How would you describe UNCG campus culture? Get better. <laughs> get better. <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah, I mean the faculty center was put up when they ripped out the faculty in, in the home economics building. It was actually. In this building, we used to have a, a cafeteria down at the bottom here, okay. and uh, the the cooks mm -hmm. for hotel management and uh, uh, hospitality. We had had nice lunches here all the time. That's where the faculty met, and Elizabeth Zinzer came along and just ended that, and then we get bitched at her, and they put faculty center up there. 
that's not a faculty center, that's just a building up there to placate the faculty. So we didn't, we never really had a campus culture until this kid, Justin, can't call him a kid, Justin Harmon came along and started to do community engagement monthly beer nights. Mm -hmm. And now it's last, it's in its second year. And so he's creating a campus culture, at least for a slice of people. Yeah. Uh, the students, they run through some of their organizations, and, and I can't be honest with you, I, I really don't know. I spend most of my time in the community mm -hmm. not doing a lot. I used to work with student organizations and stuff like that, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a fair answer. Okay. And um, I've got some stuff on asking about your current projects, and then I've got wrap-up questions. So under current projects, I've got uh, Jefferson Pilot, Excellent University, Professor of Social Work. Well, that's my title. Okay. And within that role, I'm a university professor, mm -hmm. which means I'm, this is my home. Right. Social work. But I have a responsibility to the university. So when anybody calls and asks me to do something, I do it. Mm -hmm. So I sit on these committees. I mentor these younger faculty on how to put together their promotion and tenure dossiers. I help them. I would look over their grants if they want me to do it. I broker stuff out in the community for engaged scholars. That's being a university professor. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of it, and a lot of it's hidden. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that I'm on a bunch of dissertation, well, I'm on three dissertation committees, one here, one at A&T, and one in Canada right now. So I do external, uh, out of social work work. Uh, other faculty do too, but usually not in a small department like social work with no doctoral program. They don't usually ask unless you get a specific expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm on call with my colleague right now, we haven't done anything in a while, uh, he did, he took me to the doctor to get a shot in the spine, and they asked who was out there, and I said, my reverend. <laughs> so, um, but I can, we can do anything anytime we want over at the church, it just, it just depends on what we're going to do. They're, we're working on something, but it's not worth talking about, even if this is not shown for a hundred years, uh, around gangs. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. Okay. Any other current projects you got on right now? And um, or yeah, I am. I'm going on research leave in the fall. Okay. To do research on what? Uh, my area of expertise for the last thirty years has been how the religious community um, contributes to public life. Mm -hmm. And a year and a half ago, I finished editing a special edition of a journal out of Switzerland called Religions, which covers all kinds of religion stuff. And they asked me if I would be a special guest editor on a thing called a title, Religion, Welfare, and Service, Common Ground. And I started this field of research mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Right. And a lot of my colleagues like me had to fight because we were engaged scholars, we were sort of outside of our discipline. And now this stuff has become mainline in a lot of disciplines and they've had a lot of their doctoral students go on to become prominent scholars. So I got 15, 15 articles that came out in this special edition. But what, since it's an online edition, the articles come in and the way they come in is the way they read and the way they land. So the journal asked me if I would put together a book, order the articles, write an introductory chapter, and then do a chap do a opening for each section because there are some incredibly good themes. Mm -hmm. And my colleague Jay Poole, who directs the Congregational Social Work Initiative here, wrote. He's the lead author on a beautiful piece on the Cone family mm -hmm. and its philanthropy all the way up to the Cone Health Foundation sponsoring and supporting financially this Congregational Social Work Initiative now for a decade. Mm -hmm. Jay is going to be co-editor with me mm -hmm. and he's going to have the lead article because it is really shows the, there's another article in there that shows the chicken and egg piece of philanthropy and religion. Uh, from Richmond, and it'll be right next to Jay's article, but that shows the kind of stuff that we um, 
have done for, I have done and then others now for 30 years and there's 15 articles that we will uh, edit and make it read like a nice decent book and that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing research leave on next semester. Okay. So is there anything else you'd want to talk about before I hit these wrap-up questions? Hit the wrap-up questions. All right. So what do you think makes our social work department stand out? Leadership. Melissa Floyd Pickard is an incredible leader and she's a servant leader. She allows people to do their own thing and trust them. Mm -hmm. She's not worried about the little things. What social and academic events stand out in your mind during your time at UNCG as faculty? Well, 911. Yeah. That was earth shattering. And everybody has the same story. They know where they were, what they were doing. Uh, the Reagan budget cuts. Mm -hmm. HB2. Um, The bureaucratization of UNCG. <laughs> I mean, kind of a running theme throughout the well, interview. Well, we have to take all these little tests now. On, on, uh, you can't move forward. They, they sort of imply you're not going to get paid if you don't take a test on cybersecurity. You mm -hmm. know, and you got to take seven or eight modules on and, and pass. So uh, we had to do something on confidentiality, and I said to the provost, I said. I would really like to have a meeting with all these people who develop all of this stuff and have them have take a workshop on what does the role of the faculty, what do faculty do, how important are they to the university, how should you talk to them? I mean, they are the blood and guts mm -hmm. of the place. And she just giggled. Mm -hmm. She because yeah. what, what can you say? Right. Because the truth. Yeah. Send, send them home for a month mm -hmm. and school will still get taught. Right. Send us home for a month and no school gets taught. That's true. <laughs> but in terms of pay and importance, you'd think that they're the, yeah. the most important people here. Uh, what were some of your proudest accomplishments to UNCG? <sighs> Getting a Lilly Grant. Mm -hmm. to before there was really a grant office. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an accomplishment. Um, just got one yesterday. Congratulations. Zick Namalo, uh, one of my students whose mother I had, not Namalo, and Sanwu, got into the University of Chicago. Oh, great. Yeah. Remember, we're a mid-major here. Yeah. We're, we're a mid-major social work. Yeah. Then last year it was Clint Stiles, scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania. Mm. Year before that, um, Joseph Scripp Barber, um, Columbia University. Those are, those are my accomplishments. And then we've got our last two, um, which are just kind of reflection overall questions. Um, tell me how UNCG has affected your life and what it means to you. It's like being a doctor in medical school. I had a cadaver for my entire life. I, I watched it grow and then die and then I could pick it apart. I knew the, I know the insides. Well, UNCG, being here all of these years has really, when I walk around campus or when I hear things, I know where the history and the tradition come from. Some, Sometimes it's really funny to see the look on somebody's face when you tell them, well, those 500 level courses were not never required for any reason, except that we, our two uh, faculty were going to leave if they didn't get courses taught at the level that they expected to teach after three or four years. I mean, that's not real. It was mm. not a, I say, well, we made it a requirement. To be, to live long enough to A, outlive my enemies and the people in the parking were my enemies to see some of the things that have happened. I, I weren't there. I was their enemy. They weren't mine. I didn't really 
hate in any of them. I just thought they did the wrong things confidently. Mm -hmm. And that, just being able to, to, to know the beginning and the middle and the end of many of the things that are going on on campus and not have to jump in and try to figure it out, that has been the beauty of my life here. Mm -hmm. And then our absolute last question is, these interviews are for the 125th anniversary of UNCG, which is a good time to reflect, but also a good time to look into the future. So what do you th where do you think UNCG is gonna be in the next 25 to 50 years? Chasing after football, perhaps. Trying to become a better Division One basketball player, basketball team. Giving a lot of lip service to community without the resources that go along with it. Many more adjunct professors. It will lose whatever sense of community that it has have. It'll have to cordon down to little isolated uh, hamlets of community. And um, we still won't be able to beat an ACC basketball team with regularity. All right. That's where I see us going. Okay. And yet it's still a great place to work. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.